Now I'm going to talk about how to schedule your day. One part of our daily planning that most of us don't spend enough time thinking about is how we go about scheduling our meetings, appointments, and our day. It's been my experience that most people are capable of doing their best work during the early morning hours. They've got a lot of energy, and their ability to concentrate is very good. So don't be in a hurry to schedule appointments for 8:30 or 9:15 in the morning. When someone asks if you're available at that time, just say that you've got a conflict and suggest that you meet later in the morning or perhaps after lunch. It's my suggestion that you try to keep the morning open until at least 10:30 or 11 o'clock. Let's start with a basic premise. One of the easiest ways you can throw your daily schedule off track is to schedule your appointments back to back to back. Instead, you should always assume that a meeting will start late, take longer than you had anticipated. As you plan your day, you should assume that every meeting will take at least 50% longer than you expect. Block out that additional time on your calendar. Always give yourself at least a 15-minute cushion between meetings. This guarantees that you'll have at least a moment or two to catch your breath, return a few phone calls, and look at the mail before the next meeting starts. If this first meeting should end on time, and if it doesn't, maybe you won't be too late for the next one. If you'll be out of the office, try your best to group your appointments together to eliminate the time spent driving or walking from one person's office to another. You may also want to try to schedule appointments so that you can stop on your way into the office in the morning or on your way home in the afternoon. Here are some ideas for managing your out-of-town travel. It's one thing to be losing valuable and precious time while you're sitting in traffic, but it's even easier to lose a lot of hours, if not days, sitting on an airplane. Over the years, I've heard many people brag about how much they fly. Apparently, they believe that the size of their frequent flyer mileage statements is a measure of their persistence, determination, and success, rather than a log of time wasted sitting on an airplane. Yes, laptop computers and pocket telephones can help you stay on top of things, but there's no way you can operate as effectively and efficiently when you're traveling in an airplane and living in a hotel room than when you're working in your office. Today, a person has many communications alternatives to choose from before having to hop on an airplane to meet with someone face to face. First, why not try using the telephone? You can certainly have a conversation or several of them before you've got to fly off somewhere. Then you can send materials by fax, overnight delivery, or electronic mail. And after the materials have been received. You can have another series of phone calls to discuss them. You can even rent a video conferencing center so that you can talk to other people face to face. If you've done all of the above and you feel that it's still necessary to hop on a plane and see the person face to face, then do it. Now, let's talk about business meetings for a few minutes. First, I would like to give you my thoughts on where business meetings should take place. It's my feeling that important business meetings should take place in the office, not in a restaurant. Business breakfasts, lunches, and dinners are fine for getting to know a person, but they are not good places to try to conduct important business because of the lack of privacy, constant interruptions, and continuous distractions. And when you attend a meeting, you should always be prepared. I'm constantly amazed at how unprepared some people are when they come to a business meeting. I've had business lunches where the person I was meeting didn't even have a pencil or a piece of paper to write anything on, and I've given time management seminars where the people for whom I was making the presentation didn't have anything to take notes with. That said, here's a list of things you should always have with you when you go to a meeting: a pencil or a pen. A letter-sized pad of paper, your appointment book and calendar, and business cards. In addition, you should always carry a small pen with you in your pocket or purse, and business cards in your wallet. This way, when you need to write something down, you've got the necessary tools.
I know that this probably sounds stupid because it's just common sense, but you should always check the contents of your briefcase before you leave the office for a meeting or an appointment. You just don't want to go to a meeting and discover that you left a document, a file, some miscellaneous form, or some other piece of information sitting on your desk. This becomes very important when you have an appointment scheduled for early the next morning. You certainly don't have time to go into the office, so make sure that you check your briefcase before you leave at the end of the day. And always confirm your appointments. When I was first starting out in business, I scheduled appointments days or weeks in advance and then just showed up at the person's office at the appointed time. And every once in a while, the person wasn't there. I learned a lesson the hard way. Always confirm an appointment before you leave the office. You may not be aware of this, but almost 50% of the appointments that you schedule will need to be postponed. In today's fast-paced, high-pressure business world, there are just too many things that can happen at the last minute to keep a meeting from taking place. But if you call to confirm your appointments before you leave the office, your day won't go up in flames just because the other person wasn't able to see you. Whenever you schedule an appointment, always give the person the correct spelling of your name. Then ask the person to take down your phone number and write it in his or her book. Say something like, let me give you my phone number, so that if something unexpected comes up, you can give me a call so we can reschedule it. This statement serves two purposes. First, it forces the other person to actually write down your name. Second, when you ask the person to call you if there's a conflict, it lets the person know that you're very serious about your own time. Now, if you're going to go out of your way to thoroughly prepare for your meetings and then confirm them a day or two ahead of time, you should try your best to arrive on time. Meetings play such an important part in everyday business life that it's a crying shame that so many of them are unproductive. From the studies I've seen, most of the people working in corporate America are spending at least 40% of their time sitting in these meetings. If someone's scheduling a meeting, you and everyone else should know why. If the meeting doesn't have a well-defined purpose, it shouldn't be held. You also need to know what's expected of you and what you're trying to accomplish. The best way to inform meeting participants of what the meeting's about is by preparing an agenda. In most cases, a detailed agenda should be written and distributed well in advance of the meeting. After the agenda has been distributed, it's even possible that some of the items on the agenda can be dealt with over the phone or by written correspondence. And if that's the case, these items should then be removed from the agenda. The next time you're in charge of an office meeting, close and lock the door so that late arrivals will have to knock to get in. You can then use their late arrival as an opportunity to remind them that they're expected to be on time in the future. And when you're one of the people who is asked to attend a meeting, it's okay to insist that it start on time, and it's okay to point out that the discussion has strayed too far from the items on the agenda. If the person who called the meeting isn't going to take control of it, then you should speak up and remind him or her that time's running short and you've got other things to do or another meeting to attend as soon as this meeting is over. Another question to ask yourself is, do I have to be there at all? Just because you've been invited to attend a meeting doesn't mean that you've got to attend. So if you don't think you'll have much to offer at a meeting, it's okay to call the person who scheduled the meeting and say so. Occasionally, the situation arises in which a person's presence is needed for only a small portion of the meeting. Should that be the case, when you're asked to attend a meeting, pick up the phone and ask the person who scheduled the meeting if you could attend for only the portion that applies to you. When you're asked to attend a meeting, you should always know its purpose. When you, as a meeting participant, know what's expected of you, you're better able to prepare for it. If you're the one who is calling the meeting, try to distribute all of the handouts or other information before it takes place. 
This way, everyone will have the opportunity to read and think about the topics of discussion before it starts. At the conclusion, the person who called the meeting should take a few minutes to summarize the points that were discussed and determine what's to be done next. If additional work needs to be done, those tasks should be assigned, and the people who are doing the work should be told when the tasks need to be completed. If you're the person to whom the work is being assigned, ask some questions and take detailed notes on what you're being instructed to do. Then there can be no misunderstandings about how and when it should be done. Someone's got to keep minutes of the meeting so that everyone will know what was discussed, what decisions were made, and what is to be done next, by whom, and when. These minutes should be distributed within a few days. If you thought that the biggest time waster in American business today was time wasted in meetings, you're mistaken. The biggest time waster in American business today is the inability of people to make decisions. Every organization, be it a large multinational corporation or sole proprietor working from home, has its own way of making decisions. And if you're going to be successful in getting someone to say yes, you've got to know how the organization goes about making decisions. If the decision is to be made by more than one person, you need to know who the other people are, how they fit into the organization, and what their overall level of involvement in the decision-making process is. After you know who the decision-makers are, you should meet with them individually or speak with them on the phone, if that's appropriate, in order to try to win them over and sell them on the benefits of your product, service, or idea. Sometimes you'll find yourself dealing with a person who is in a position to influence the final decision, but is not in a position to make the final decision. In situations like these, you've got to be sure that you've sold the decision influencer. If you haven't, he or she won't be very enthusiastic about presenting it to the other people who will participate in the final decision. To find out whether the person you're dealing with has the authority to make a decision, or if he or she needs to consult with someone else, you should always ask this type of question somewhere along the way. Before you make your final decision, is there anyone else with whom you want or need to consult? When you're asking someone to make a decision, your goal is to get them to say yes. The only way you can get people to say yes is by asking them to say yes. If you don't ask, you don't get. Now, the first time you ask a person to say yes, he or she will probably say no, and at the same time give you a reason why they said no. This is called an objection. So if you want somebody to say yes to whatever product, service, or idea you're selling, you had better be prepared to stick around for a while. Just because a person says no once or twice doesn't mean that he or she won't say yes if you continue to ask a third, fourth, or a fifth time. The process of getting people to say yes is the process of building on agreement. As you successfully deal with each objection, you eventually change people's opinions about your product, service, or idea. Your goal is to move people from feeling indifferent to feeling positive about whatever you have to offer. When you perceive that a person's attitude is one of indifference, it's time to start probing. You probe for areas of discomfort or areas of dissatisfaction with the present situation. You do this by asking open-ended questions, questions that can't be answered with a yes or no. Your goal is to help people become aware of a problem or to help them realize that they aren't entirely satisfied with something. After you've done so, you have the opportunity to point out that the product, service, or idea you're offering provides a solution to that problem. People are always more comfortable when they identify a problem and then discover its solution all by themselves. You're just there to help them along. One of the most effective closing methods is getting people to discuss how, not if, they're going to buy. Make a request for action. To close the sale, you've got to ask for the order. If you don't ask, you probably won't get it. 
In this section of the tape, I'm going to give you a lot of tips, ideas, techniques, and strategies that you can use to make it easier for you to communicate information with all of the important people in your business life. If you were to look at your daily activities, there are two certainties in addition to death and taxes. You're going to spend a lot of time in meetings, and when you're not in meetings, you're going to be on the telephone. Look at how far we've come with the telephone in just the last 40 years. We've gone from phones you had to dial, to touch-tone phones, to having the computer dial the phone for us. But putting all this fancy, high-tech stuff aside for a moment, the phone is still a device that you and I use so that we can communicate with each other. Being aware of how you sound and come across on the phone is one thing. But why are you making a call in the first place? In today's high-pressure business world, we don't have the luxury of wasting time. Yet, one of the biggest time wasters of all is the phone call that has no apparent purpose. Spend a few moments thinking about and preparing yourself for each call before you make it. Treat each call as if it were a face-to-face -face business meeting. When you get off the phone, you should write a brief note to summarize what was said, who's going to do what, and when it's supposed to be done. This note should be put in the appropriate file, and, if there's work to do, it should be added to your master list. If you spend a lot of time making business calls, you should know that there are certain times during the day when you're most likely to reach a person. As a general rule, people are usually at their desks from 9 to 11 in the morning and from about 2 to 4 in the afternoon. You should always block out these times on your calendar so that you can get on the telephone and make your calls. Now, let me ask you a question. What do you do when your phone rings? You need some techniques that will help you with your incoming calls, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. First, you don't have to answer every call. Just because the phone rings doesn't mean that you have to answer it. Whenever the phone rings, it's an interruption. And if you're in the midst of doing something important, the last thing you want to do is allow yourself to be interrupted. When you do answer the phone, you need to know the answers to two questions. Who's calling and what do they want? If a caller doesn't identify him or herself, or is very vague about the purpose or nature of the call, it's okay to say goodbye and hang up the phone. If you do want to talk to the caller, you should ask, how much time is this going to take? If the call will just take a few minutes, you may wish to have the conversation now. Otherwise, you should schedule a time to talk later in the day. Most important, you want to avoid spending 30 minutes on a call when you should be completing your important work. No one has enough time during the course of the workday. And one of the ways you can give yourself more time is to minimize the number and length of your social calls. As an alternative to talking on the phone, perhaps you should meet for lunch or dinner. Every once in a while, you're going to have to talk to people who are very angry and upset. Unless you've done something to anger these people, you must remember that they are not angry with you, but rather with a situation or a problem. Don't take personally any of the things that they say about you, your company, or your products. Just let such callers vent their feelings and blow off some steam. Within a few minutes, they'll wear themselves out, the fury and rage will subside, and they'll regain their composure. When the angry caller calms down, you can then try to solve the problem. And remember... A person who takes the time to complain is a person who wants to continue doing business with you. By complaining, people are telling you what it is they want or need from you. When people call to complain, don't become defensive or argumentative. Just thank them for telling you what it is they're unhappy with, and then say something like, Thank you for taking the time to call. I'm glad you brought that to my attention. We'll do our best to try and solve this problem for you. And finally, don't pick up someone else's phone. Have you ever walked by someone's desk when the phone was ringing and decided that you would be a nice person and answer the phone? The caller had a problem, and he or she wanted you to help solve it. 
or the caller wanted to leave a detailed message, but you couldn't find a pencil or a piece of paper, and then you forgot to tell the intended recipient about the call. So the next time you hear someone else's phone ringing, just let it ring. The call will be transferred to the receptionist or to the person's voicemail. Now I would like to share with you some thoughts about how to increase your productivity with voicemail. Sometimes I long for the good old days when everyone had a secretary who was always available to take messages. But times have changed. The secretaries are gone, we're typing all of our own letters, and we've got machines that answer our phone for us when we aren't there. Here are some reasons why you should be using voicemail. Voicemail enables you to share information without actually speaking to the other person. Voicemail lets you communicate in non-real time. You don't have to wait until noon, rise at 6 a.m., or stay awake until midnight to call someone on the other side of the country or on the other side of the world. Here are some tips about what you should include in your voicemail messages. Leave instructions so that callers can leave messages without having to listen to your message each time they call, and leave instructions so that the caller can be transferred to someone else. Remember, the biggest complaint that callers have about voicemail systems is the inability to reach a live person on demand. Now I'd like to take a moment and share with you some of my thoughts on how to write more effective correspondence. Today, almost everyone in corporate America has a computer sitting on the top of the desk, and we're being asked to do some things with them that we haven't done in a long time. Write letters, memos and reports, create presentations, and send and reply to electronic mail messages. Good writing makes it easy for you to communicate your ideas to other people, and it helps them make better business decisions. In today's busy world, no one has time to read, so the people who are responsible for making business decisions want to get the information they need from their letters, memos, reports, and email messages, and then make a decision without wasting a lot of time. So to make everybody's life easier, you've got to be good at putting your thoughts and ideas on paper, using words that the reader understands, and then arranging this information in a concise and thorough way that's easy to comprehend. Your goal is to communicate information to people and also obtain a favorable response from them. After you write something, put it aside for a little while and then come back to it. When you resume your writing, you'll see new ways to improve what you put down on paper. Your goal is to write well, not necessarily quickly. When you're composing your letters, memos, or reports, you want to make it easy for the reader to understand what you're saying. So write short sentences, brief paragraphs, and use words that are familiar to your reader. Writing isn't much more than putting the spoken word down on paper. And you can make writing a lot easier if you just imagine that you're having a face-to-face -face conversation like two friends sitting around a coffee table having a nice friendly chat. Revising, rewriting, and editing your work are all a part of good writing. Good writing consists of a constant effort to find and eliminate the unnecessary word no matter how small. Email is an electronic medium that millions of people use to share information. It's become extremely popular in corporate America because it's more efficient than using the telephone, less formal than writing a letter, and much faster than snail mail, the United States Postal Service. When email is used properly, it's a huge time saver because it allows you to share information with someone down the hall or halfway across the world in just a moment's time. But if you're spending one, two, or even three hours per day responding to your email messages, it's become an enormous time waster and it's taking away from the time that you should be spending on your other work. The whole concept behind using email is that it's fast, short, and sweet. You don't worry about spelling, punctuation, or grammatical errors. You don't edit or proofread your writing. You just write your message and send it. It's sort of like an electronic memo pad. The subject line is the most important part of your email message. It's the first thing the recipient sees, 
so it should be short, concise, descriptive, and informative. If action is required on the part of the reader, put it in the subject line. For example, write please attend Tuesday's meeting or need reply by Wednesday morning. When you write your email message, write short, easy-to-read sentences and paragraphs. Put the most important information in the first few sentences of the first paragraph. If you must send a long message, attach the file as an enclosure. Write a brief description of the message in the subject line. The email message itself should be a more detailed description of the enclosed file. Make it easy for people to respond to your email messages. When you write your message, be sure to include enough information so that recipients can give you a quick answer or response. Phrase your messages so that readers can reply with a yes or no, and if you're going to ask for a reply, mention it in your subject line. And now I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts about setting goals. With continued downsizing, the people working in corporate America, people like you and me, have to look out for ourselves. The days of lifetime employment are gone. There's no longer a benevolent employer who's going to take care of us throughout our career. If we don't look out for our own best interests, who will? So you should focus your energies on your activities. By doing so, you can accomplish the majority of the things you set out to do because it's easy to manage activities. On the other hand, you can't manage results. Results are the end product. They're the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Results come after a lot of hard work and effort. So instead of focusing on results, it's much more important to sit down and identify which activities need to be done and then go out and do them. And before you know it, you've achieved more than you ever dreamed. To be successful in today's extremely competitive business environment, you must spend as much time as you can doing the things that are important and as little time as possible doing the things that keep you busy but hardly productive. Just spend your time and energy doing the right things every day. Set activity goals for yourself, not results goals, and the results will take care of themselves. An important part of goal setting, the one that many people overlook, is the part that pertains to time. Most people don't give themselves enough time to accomplish their goals. The shorter the time frame of your goal, the more real it becomes. It's okay to set long-term or annual goals, but if you want to achieve them, you have to create a plan that breaks them down into smaller and smaller goals. Annual goals should become quarterly goals. Quarterly goals should become monthly goals. Monthly goals should become weekly goals. The most important part of the planning process is to write your goals down on paper so that you can see them. Identifying your goals and then putting them down on paper will take some time, thought, and consideration. But as I've said before, the more time you can spend thinking and planning your course of action, the easier it will be. Share your goals and dreams with your friends, colleagues, and coworkers, and discuss your plans to achieve them. Many of your friends will have thoughts or ideas that can help you accomplish your goals, and they would certainly like to be kept abreast of your progress. Early in my business career, a close friend sat me down and asked me a pointed question. She said, Jeff, which do you prefer, pleasing habits or pleasing results? As I pondered her question, I became uncomfortable and started squirming like a worm on the end of a hook. From that point on, I started to take a harder look at the things I did, why I did them, and how I did them. In closing, I would like to share with you my thoughts on the secret of success. I know that a lot of people are looking very hard for the secret of success, but they won't find it in a book, lecture, or seminar. You find success inside yourself. It's your attitude, your perspective on life, your willingness to learn, and your willingness to try new things that will determine your ability to achieve the things you desire. Only you can motivate yourself. Other people can show you how to do something, but you've got to do it yourself. 
Many of our work habits were acquired early in our careers. But just because you've done something one way for a long time doesn't mean that you've got to continue doing it the same way in the future. Look for new mountains to climb and new rivers to cross. Just because you've never done something before doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to do it. Or even if you tried to do something and weren't successful, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try a second or a third time. Don't be afraid of failure. If you haven't experienced failure, you haven't been trying hard enough. When you succeed, relish the fruits of your hard work. When you fail, see failure not as an end in and of itself, but as an opportunity for learning. It gives you the opportunity to look back and to analyze what happened. What did you do right? What did you do wrong? What worked? What didn't? And why? Then go back out and try again. The only time you must not fail is the last time you try. After you begin to set goals for yourself, you start to accept personal responsibility and you become accountable for the things you do. When you take responsibility for your actions, you quickly discover who you are, learn what you're made of, and determine what it is that you stand for. Work hard and strive to do your best. Try to excel at everything you do. Your greatest asset is the fact that you're unique. You are blessed with wonderful skills, talents, and abilities, and no one else has those same skills, talents, and abilities. Therefore, it's important that you work hard to be the best you that you can be. Your overall objective in learning how to use your time more effectively is to get your work done on time and do it well. When you've done that, it's time to go home. With the time you've saved at work, you have more time for yourself. You can spend more time doing the things that you love and enjoy. You can spend more time with your family, friends, and the other people who are important to you. You can see a movie or a play or watch a ball game. You can read a book, magazine, or a newspaper. You can take a vacation. You've earned it.